and then I can interrupt myself. Uh, yeah, so we meet every week on Wednesdays at noon. Uh, In-person seminars should be starting back up soon, but I'll ever, let everyone know when that happens. Um, they'll also uh, always be streamed too. This is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel where you can find almost all of our seminars over the past couple of years. Uh, now we'd respectfully uh, like to offer a land acknowledgement. Respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather is the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland is the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nenetsiavut and Nenetukavut and the Inuit of Natasanen and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. So today I'm going to be the seminar speaker. Uh, we've had a few gaps in the seminar schedule this semester, and so I apologize for that. I'm just, you know, I'm a busy master's student. And uh, by way of apology, I offered to provide a seminar on ident animal identification uh, free of charge, but I do charge $5 per email after this. Yeah, I'm kidding about that. Please reach out to me if you want more advice or clarification on what we talk about today, or if you just have any questions about things we didn't discuss, because I, I could not put even close to all the animals I know how to ID uh, in this presentation. That would take, I could do the entire seminar series this whole semester on a invertebrate, probably just on polychaetes actually. So the reason I feel comfortable doing this with like minimal practice is because I identified animals for six years as a biologist. I spent two years uh, identifying marine and freshwater fish and some larger invertebrates in Alaska, Washington, and Oregon. And I spent four years identifying mostly really small invertebrates in Florida. They, they bigger ones too, but mostly microscopic uh, and plankton and stuff like that. I am a master's student here at the Marine Institute studying fisheries technology, and I have, I have a graduate certificate from UF in quantitative fisheries science and a bachelor's from Washington State University in zoology. So I did study animals um, coming up, but mostly invertebrates. Um, and uh, yeah, with that, we will begin. So how to identify marine animals. So I put fish worms in almost everything in between. I should put hardly everything in between because there are so many animals out there, but I am going to give you uh, uh, a beginner's manual for all of them, or for a few of them. Okay, so here's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we'll, t we'll begin with the tools that you need, um, and then some examples of field guides that you might want to get your hands on if you actually have to do this for an occupation, or um, if you just ha are just curious. Uh, a lot of these things can be found online for free, like some manuscripts, um, and uh, yeah, so I'll give you some examples of that. You can take pictures or screenshots, or if you email me afterwards, I can just send you, um, I can just send you this presentation. And then we'll go into how to ID. Um, we'll do some examples with uh, fish, um, snails, clams, uh, arthropods, which are all the crunchy things, and then um, some worms. So the materials that you need for like actually professionally uh, identifying things. There's definitely going to be a dissecting microscope and, and probably a compound scope. So you're going to want to go at least from 10 times magnification to probably at least 200, especially for polychaetes, you're going to want 200. And that's to look at little hairs on them that you can't see with your naked eye. Even under a dissecting scope that goes to 64 magnification, it's not good enough. You're also going to want some really sharp forceps, so some tweezers. Uh, the thing is, is if you think they're sharp, they're not sharp enough. You need some really sharp ones, you know, don't don't skimp on the forceps, pay $20 for repair, that, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I, I've dropped them a few times and they just go through my jeans and stick up straight up into my leg and uh, and they just stand there straight up. So that's how sharp they should be. It hurts. And I actually buy a, a file for it, a little um, um, hobby file, and I, I can sharpen it so I don't have to keep buying them. 
Um, you're gonna want, you're gonna definitely need lots of guidebooks and manuscripts um, if you're gonna do it professionally. If you wanna do it as a hobby, uh, maybe a couple really general guidebooks for your area. Uh, it can be really useful. I've noticed that Newfoundland doesn't have a lot of guidebooks for, for shore life most likely because there's not a lot of shore life half the year. Uh, but I will say I, I was in um, uh, Harbor, Harbor Breton um, and I did see quite a few animals that I would have loved to ID and I would love, had, love to have had a um, field guide on what you could find there. Uh, if you ID some things like sea cucumbers and uh, sponges, you're gonna want some bleach. Uh, <laughs> and I'll, I'll show you why. Uh, and I might, I might have some pictures on my computer about that. I didn't put them in the presentation and I didn't have sea cucumbers in the presentation, but I have ID'd them uh, quite a few times. And yeah, you need bleach and a, and a good uh, identification book with, uh, with microspectrometry or whatever uh, images. So you'll need scalpels to cut things apart, uh, maybe a little pair of scissors, tiny pair of scissors, you know, like nose hair trimmer scissors, those would be good. And, uh, You'll want slides and slide covers for the polychaetes and uh, petri dishes, lots of petri dishes. Keep everything in place. So here's some identification books and guides for fish. Um, so you have your skates and rays and sharks. And these are just uh, good websites. DFO has some good identification um, guides for these things. The, the nice thing about being in this northern, uh, these northern latitudes and these cold waters uh, in Canada is that there's not a lot of diversity. Um, there's a lot of abundance, but there's not a lot of diversity, which makes your job identifying things so much easier. Uh, when you go down to Florida, where I was at, oh my gosh, you know, it was, it was tough, but it's, so it, it can still get confusing though. So here's some identification guides. Uh, this, this one right here for, um, let's get my, here we go. This one for the uh, fish in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. This is an older one, but it's really good. And it, it's mostly focused on the Gulf of St. Lawrence, but it works for the Atlantic, um, for more like Labrador Sea area too. I just wouldn't rely on it 100% when you start to do uh, stuff out there. But it's really good, it's really good. Uh, there was an observer on a boat that I was on um, up by Nain on a big shrimp boat, and he was using this quite a bit. Uh, this one is actually really good too, really good pictures, but it it kind of sh shares a lot of uh, fish from more towards uh, Europe too. So, so, you know, some of them don't pertain to this area, but some of them really do. And there's, because it's deep sea fishes, there's not a lot of good stuff out there for them. So this is really helpful, at least to get you to the right genus. Uh, and if you are, one of the very unfortunate few people who have to identify larval fishes. I found this book. Um, I'm sorry if that's your case. And larval fish are very tough. And usually you can only get down to a family or a genus. Uh, sometimes you can get to a species, but it's not too common. So don't beat yourself up if it's getting too hard for you. Okay, so screenshot this. I'm not gonna run through all these, but here's some identification books for plankton. Um, yeah, other invertebrates. And there's so much stuff out there on how to ID them. I would say some of the best books aren't from this area. And they're, they're worth checking out. So like this one right, Light and Smith manual right here. It's from the Pacific coast. Um, so you're not gonna wanna use it to identify the species, but it will really help you because it's so thorough, it will help you on um, genus, family and genus for sure. And that will narrow your search down um, when it comes to looking up manuscripts. Um, if it's not in a book here in Newfoundland, then you'll find it in a manuscript probably. So you'll know what genus to look for is what I'm saying. So that's, that's always nice. Um, yeah, so I highlight right here, manuscripts, you know, um, the manuscripts are great, but they are uh, really hard to find. And 
because they're so specific, uh, it's really nice when somebody finally compiles them all. When you uh, want to make sure that all your sources are up to date, because these books are, you know, they, they were printed and, and they get older and taxonomy moves pretty rapidly um, at the bane of taxonomy existence. No, no taxonomist likes um, the, the fact that this taxonomy changes all that much. But if you want to stay up to date, you go to this website right here for invertebrates. It's it's um, worms. If you type in worms and then an animal, it should pop up. Um, this should be the first website you get. And this will tell you whether or not it's still uh, commonly or it's still the accepted species name. And it'll tell you the old ones too. Here's one for fish. I, I, most people know this one is fish base. Uh, not a lot of people know the worms one though. So this one's really helpful too. And then so many more books and internet resources, you know, um, there's things that I haven't, I've never had to ID things up here for a living. I, I did do it for fun and in, in, in uh, out of Nain and up more towards uh, Southern none of it, but I haven't had to do it for a living. So, you know, I didn't spend too much time looking up the resources here. So if you're in Newfoundland, um, good luck, you know, ask me and I, maybe I'll be able to help you actually. So I do like to stress the importance of learning the anatomy of an animal and you don't have to like memorize it, but you should have at least a diagram with you uh, when you're IDing these things at, at all times, just as a reference guide. So um, an example would be fish right here. You have your, um, you have your general anatomy of your maxilla on the mouth. Here, let me do the cursor here. Um, save your maxilla and this is important to, to know like this seems like innocuous maybe you don't need to know anything about the jaw but it's really helpful when IDing some animals with some fish because sometimes it extends beyond the eye and that's an identification feature it separates two different species you know stuff like that is is what you want to be paying attention to I know a lot of people will probably just be taking pictures and tossing the animal back in the ocean that's fine, just make sure you get the right pictures as well. Cause it sucks when when you take two two or three, what you thought were good pictures, you toss it back and then you realize you should have held up the dorsal fin. You're like, oh, now I don't know if it's this species or that species. So it, it's good to get very specific, um, good pictures. And I think I included a picture of me doing that in the beginning, let me go back to that. Yeah, so you see right here, I'm holding up the dorsal fin on these because I want to show um, what is going on. Like there's the separation right here. Um, and that, so that's good to know. There's like these notches, uh, dorsal fin notches is what they call them. And you can see this one, this one's just fleshy. Uh, there's not much of, you know, when it comes to rays, there's not, I think there's six or seven little tiny rays. So it's just good to know that kind of stuff. If you don't pull that fin up, you might be missing something. Okay, let me go back. Your lateral line is really important um, on fish identification on some fish because uh, a lot of times it'll be really tall or it'll do a certain some some fish have like five of them uh, if they're in the family hexagramidae it's pretty common for them to have like three or more you have your caudal fin shape i know a lot of you are probably familiar with your fish identification but i just want to review it a little bit uh your dorsal fins you, you can have one or two um and yeah, so there's, there's variability in that. And sometimes they connect at the middle, sometimes they don't, that's stuff you wanna know. And that's another reason why you hold up the fin to take a picture. Uh, your anal fin, the spines, especially in these rock fishes right here, which is uh, Sebastes. Uh, this one might not be Sebastes, but it's the same family. Uh, it's related to the redfish. This is from uh, Alaska. I believe this is a sharp chin, or no, it's a gray, gray rockfish, <laughs> uh, something like that, or uh, silver gray, silver gray rockfish, that's what it is. Um, but they, they're really tough to ID, and you have to know all these different little things. Um, but like I said, you don't have to memorize them, just be, just be familiar and uh, have a diagram with you. You also want to learn some basic orientation uh, terminology, and that's just to help you get through these, uh, get through these manuals. So when it comes to like 
uh, if you go, if you want to say upper part of the body, that's dorsal, uh, lower part, that's ventral. If you want to say it's more towards the back, that's caudal or posterior. Anterior is forwards, superior is usually like up a little bit, inferior is down a little bit, and then et cetera. There's, there's all sorts of, there's lateral, which is more towards the side. Um, there's infralateral, interla there's just so many different orientation things. And if you don't know them, it's so easy to get hung up and just quit. You're like, I don't even know what I'm reading right now. Interal, interlateral dorsal spine or so. I, we used to make fun of that at uh, my old job. So what I'd really like to stress is just to be observant. You know, you can't just look at a fish, think you know it, and be like, this is my fish. I see it so much from commercial fishermen. I used to be a commercial fisherman, um, and we, we are all guilty of it. Um, even the professionals are pretty guilty of it. You just, you're just too confident sometimes. I, I would stress, don't be so confident. Be observant. Um, look at colors and patterns, spines. The number of spines on it, fin placement. If you know you have a uh, an animal that's really tough to identify, like let's say a redfish, you know maybe if if it's already dead, maybe you can um, count the spines on it, uh, or and you can make a note of that if if you really want to know which which species you're looking at. And that's that's me saying that without actually knowing exactly how people identify them. This is just stuff you should write down. And, and then when you go to ID it later, you'll have that information. Uh, fin shapes are really important. Lateral line shape, like I said earlier, eye placement, eye size, mouth size, mouth placement. These are all things to pay attention to. So, so like on this animal right here, it has a, more a terminal mouth. So it's more towards the end. But then there's fish with an anterior, and then there's fish with a, or not, um, dorsal, sorry, dorsal uh, facing mouth, and then there's fish with a, with a ventral facing mouth, you know, like your, um, maybe more like your catfish or your sturgeon or stuff like that, where it's more downwards facing. And that, that can really help you on identifying between families and whatnot. Now, I threw a little, uh, threw a little tricky one in here. So, I do like to stress uh, colors and patterns. That's really important, but there's also sexual dimorphism in fish. Uh, it's really common, especially in reef fishes, but here, at least not, maybe not in Newfoundland, but this one is in, um, this is a kelp greenling right here in Alaska. And this is the female and this is the male. So they look completely different. You know, their, their shape isn't exactly the same. Their patterns completely different and their coloration is completely different. So, so you want to make sure, you know, you, you're not 100% relying on that color and that pattern to be like, I know what fish that is. If you've never seen a male kelp greenling, then you might, you might completely miss that, you know? So, so be observant when it comes to colors and patterns, but don't, uh, it, but it's so variable and there's sexual dimorphism that you know, don't rely on it 100%. I will say though, this is the only skate right here, the big skate. It's the only one with a pattern like this in all of uh, 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 the North Pacific, I think. So if you see this pattern on a skate, you, you're done. It's a big skate. Um, that's the common name anyway. And these, these uh, fish are really cool. I believe they have three lateral lines. Triple the smelling power. All right. Uh, so when it comes to specialized body types, they have their own things that you look for. Uh, when your skates and rays, you might be looking at nose, um, your nose if it's floppy, or if this one is, has some cartilage in the front. So looking at stuff like that, you know, your texture of the skate. This one's really smooth. Um, you can probably tell it's really shiny, um, but and this one's really rough. This is a mud skate right here, and this is a long nose skate. And then also looking at the spines. So, so each type of, so what I'm trying to say is here is each type of fish is going to have different things you want to pay special attention to. Um, when it comes to flat fishes, your compressed fishes, like your flounders and whatnot, there's an anal spine right here on some and there's not on the other. So that, like, there's this bone that runs forward right here and I'm indicating with my finger right there, I'm touching it and showing that it's stopping my finger. So on some fish, they don't have that. 
um, and it's a good way it's a good way to part in the um, in an identification manual. You know, if you go to the left on this identification manual, you have these families. If you go to the right, you go you have all these families, and um, and yeah, so it can really be really helpful to to rule out a bunch of families. Uh, here's just some spines on the side of it, and you know, some of these species have very specific identification signs. This is an Alaskan place. It's the only uh, flatfish up in Alaska that has spines like this, these tubercles. So you don't even really have to try that hard. So if you know you have an animal that's super unique in its identification characteristics, then by all means, you know, like you got it. You don't have to pay attention that much. Um, and then there's eel type stuff. These are tough. They're tough for me anyway. It just depends on the family you're looking at. Uh, you look at the fins, like right here is a fin um, and it has a little black spot on it. I'm holding it up with forceps here. It has a little black spot. That's a key indicator that this is, um, what is it? I think it's a searcher. Um, this, this has been like eight years ago and I still remember this is a searcher. It's a type of ronk will I think, or, uh, or forget what it, forget what it is. Here's an eel pout though, a waddled eel pout. Um, but yeah, if you know your, if you know um, what type of eels or eel type animals you're looking at, you should know. Uh, maybe maybe you have to look for this pattern right here, or maybe you have to look at the shape of the pelvic or uh, the pectoral fins, uh, or if the anal fin connects to the caudal fin. So eel type fish, I would say probably the toughest fishes for me anyway. All right, so I'm gonna change gears here. We're gonna go to snails. I had this set up differently uh, in the past when I gave the seminar in person, uh, but I, I thought I'd bring maybe more, um, maybe more snails and stuff like that to the front since, since a lot of people just wanna go to the beach and, and, and ID things. So we'll put the most important things up front here. So here's uh, some diagrams that I drew. And this is me, this is me not like trying to show off uh, when I drew them. I mean, I'm definitely showing off right now when I'm, when I'm showing them to you. But when I drew them, it was just me trying to learn the anatomy, um, trying to become more familiar with it. Because when I was going through these books, and I didn't know anything about invertebrates when I started that job at UF. And I was just so lost in the ID guides. And it, it was honestly a little bit overwhelming. So if you get to be a little bit familiar with what these terms mean, it can be so helpful uh, in your in just giving you some confidence in going through the book. You don't have to, like I said, you don't have to memorize it, but having these on hand is really helpful. So when it comes to snails, mollusks in general, I hated them so much. I, thank goodness I worked for a guy who was a malacologist, which means he specialized in mollusks. Um, I, I, I was pretty good at them, but they were a lot tougher for me than almost anything else. The reason why, and I'll show you, is because of color. Um, so the color patterns can be a bit, um, they're super variable. And for a good example of this, is uh, the species name of a lot of these uh, shellfish uh, of the mollusks is variabilis. That's how variable they are. The species name is variabilis. So, so that's why I hate them. But some of them are easy, especially up here in the in the North Atlantic, because there aren't aren't as many to look for, or as uh, like down in Florida. Here's an American pelican foot that I got up near um, near Nain, I believe and uh, offshore name and here's a whelk from conception bay i don't remember which whelk this was um i did id it i just don't remember which one it was though uh, this came from a crab pot actually and this one we got trawling uh here's a, an auger or a turret shell and this is these two are from florida and this one actually has a little hermit crab inside of it so it, it, the snail isn't alive anymore. It's got, and this might be maybe four mil, five millimeters long so, or tall. So that's the scale we're dealing with here. And uh, so what you want to look for on snails is boral count, which means 
it's these things right here. So you have one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, probably five. Five in a protoconf, which is this top part. So that's one thing you want to keep track of. Really helpful with identifying snails. Uh, you want to pay attention to these ribs right here. So these ribs are going up and down. And a lot of ribs go left and right, like this one. Um, so that's another thing that's really helpful. Even at the species level, some gene, some genera can have a lot of variation with just the ribs. And coloration, I don't even care. I, <laughs> because it's so variable between populations, um, coloration is just so tough to count on when it comes to gastropods. There are very few cases where, uh, at least that I can think of, where coloration is something that you need to look at. So yeah, pay attention to the ribs, the number of whorls, whether or not it has a siphon right here. So like this one has a siphon. Some of them just end like that. Um, so, and it helps them when they're buried in the mud, this sticks up and is acts as maybe a little bit of a um, snorkel, I guess. So yeah, um, and there's an operculum right here. Sometimes they ID uh, these snails based on the operculum. I've never done that. Uh, so if you have to do that, you maybe you can teach me something. So you go into clams, it's the same story. Uh, don't trust the color. So these are all one species right here. These are all one species. Here it is on the on like the normal scale without any magnification. And here it is under the microscope. I took a picture. And they're all not only are these all the same species, but they're all from the same sample. They're all from the same like square. Um, so you don't trust color. Sometimes you can't even trust patterns on them. Uh, but I will say, when you look at a clam, it's it's a lot like uh, the snail, where you look at these ribs right here, and and um, some of these striations, which are these these cuts that go across the side from side to side. You look at the hinge, so right here. So look at the hinge and the shape of it. And then if you get really into it, you have to look at hinge teeth. Uh, you might have to look at, um, let's see, let's go back up to here to the right here. You might have to look at the paleo line. You have to dry out the clam and probably shine a light through it and try to see the shape of this paleo line, paleo line um, which is so tough. <laughs> but the teeth right here on the inside of the hinge are is a big, um, big one that people use to identify clams. So if you have a tough clam, Pay attention to the hinge teeth. It's really going to help you out when you go through the manuals anyway. The, I would say just to prep you when you do mollusk uh, identification that the manuals aren't like other manuals where it, it splits off um, and you know you just follow it down the list. No, because there aren't very many good manuals like that. They're just picture after picture after picture and they describe it it's just a little bit tougher i, I just don't like it <laughs> but i had to do it a lot uh here's one that's super tiny super tiny and it's actually commensal with a a worm that lives inside of a shell uh an old um an old snail shell so the reason why i bring that up is because some of these animals not just the clams, but they're they're only found in certain areas. So it, it's all in context, right? So I don't even have to look at the identification guide when I know that this clam was living with um, a peanut worm in a shell. Then I know immediately that it's Pythonella cuneata. I haven't done this job for two years. I still remember the names of all these things. Uh, and, but it's a live bearing clam, which is really neat. It's Pretty rare. Anyway, sorry, I nerd out over that a little bit. Um, but yeah, context is really important when it comes to identifying these things. Where did you find it? You know, if it's a shell that's washed up on the beach, it's a little harder to do. Um, but if you if you find these things in very specific environments, you know, maybe five meters depths, maybe a hundred meters depths, maybe with um, maybe with a uh, sand dollar or something like that, uh, it can really help you uh, narrow down. You know, you look for a clam that's commensal with a worm done. Somebody's already done a paper on it or several. 
So when it comes to decapods, okay, crunchy things. Um, we got some crabs and shrimp, and then there's your hermit crabs. Well, I won't go into hermit crabs. They're they're actually pretty tough. There's a lot of diversity when you start to get into the Caribbean and stuff like that, more tropical waters, and they're generally super small and they're pretty tough to ID. So when it comes to decapods, though, this is where your your anatomy your anatomy lessons are actually gonna really pay off. Uh, I would, even if you are really familiar with these animals, you're gonna want a guide next to you probably. So with the crab, you look for the shape of the carapace. If it's round, you know, like a snow crab right here, or if it's maybe like a moon pie or like a crescent moon, you know, this is a, this is a, uh, it's Fortuna Day, it's a swimming crab. And this one's a little more triangular. Uh, so yeah, so so that's one thing, that's the first thing I'll look at. And then you wanna look at um, the claws on it. And like I said, you, maybe you're gonna be throwing these things back right away. Or maybe you just picked it up on the beach, you don't wanna take it home because it's rotting. Make sure you take a picture of the claw. Um, take a picture of the carapace of the of the body. And then I would recommend flipping it over and taking a picture of the legs too, because sometimes um, these walking legs are very specific lengths compared to each other, and that will be an identification feature in your manual. Um, so, so like one key characteristic I would say on this one right here specifically is that it has these flattened posterior walking legs. They're actually swimming legs. And immediately when I see that, I know it's in the family Fortuna Day. That that whole family, I think there's one example of a crab in that family that doesn't have them, but the rest of them have the swimming legs. And I don't think swimming legs are found in any other crab. I could be wrong. Definitely not in Florida anyway. Um, and then the next thing you want to look at for a lot of these crabs is uh, teeth count on the on the sides of the carapace here. So how many how many of these these little spikes does it have? And that's that's the teeth count. Um, so this one should have nine, and um, immediately that will take you somewhere into the key, and then five will take you to ovalip. In this family, if it has five, that's definitely means it's in ovalipes, I believe. If it has seven, I think it's in uh, uh, Fortunus or or there's another one too. Anyway, it helps you out, right? Okay, another thing you can look at is the rostrum. This is really helpful in king crabs, uh, I will say, and also snow crab. Um, so maybe not here in Newfoundland, actually. Over in Alaska, there's another species that's really closely related to snow crab, and it, it, they hybridize a lot and to different degrees, you know, along multiple generations. So I actually don't know how they're, they haven't, you know, merged yet, but, uh, but so this is a tanner crab, a Kinesides tanneri, and its rostrum faces up, it curls up. And then here's a Kinesides apelio, uh, so the snow crab, the one that you find here, and it's straight. So that's when you know, there, there's other things you can look at, the color, but that's variable. Like I said, you know, color is variable. So even though on average, this one's a little bit more red and this one's a little bit more white, that's an average. So you're going to mess up if you just go based on color. So anyway, you want to look at spines, uh, leg spines sometimes, uh, leg length. So just take pictures of all this stuff. You know, if I find a new crab at the beach, what I'm doing is I'm taking pictures from the top and I'm flipping it over and taking pictures from the bottom. And then I take a picture of the claws. And that's probably about it. Um, yeah, so that's really important stuff on a crab. I love crabs. When it comes to shrimp, shrimp is where it gets really tough on terminology. Uh, so like I said earlier, there's supraorbital, suborbital, infraorbital. That's all describing spines around this little eye. And a lot of times you're dealing with, you know, this shrimp right here, that's only seven or eight millimeters long. So when you're looking at spines around the eye, it is really helpful to, to know your terminology. And that's not even uh, maybe anatomy so much as in just knowing your orientation, the prefixes like supra, super, infra, dorso, dorsolateral, stuff like that. 
it's confusing, I know. Abdomen shape. Um, this is really helpful for some shrimp, not for others. Uh, I do want to talk about this one. This is a tiger, a giant tiger prawn. We found it uh, trawling in in Florida off of Cape Canaveral. They're not uh, native to Florida, like almost nothing's native to Florida, I swear. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but I think they were being farmed and they got a big hurricane and the farm, the, um, the hurricane washed a bunch of the individuals in the farm out to sea and then they just became uh, endemic or invasive, I guess, to the area. And they're there now, but the, yeah, this is my hand. Uh, this thing is really big. It's a big shrimp. Uh, I believe it's Peneus monodon. So yeah, these things you can't, you can't, once you learn them, you can't remove them. Uh, so, so you look at relative um, lengths. So <clears throat> what I mean by that is how long is the body, the abdomen compared to the carapace? That's something you might want to take a look at. It just depends on the species or the family or the genus. These are things you'll see in the ID books. Um, if you know, ex if you know kind of the animals you deal with, then maybe you can narrow it down to what you should be paying attention to. Your uropods and your telson. Let me go back up to here. Um, the uropods and telson are are right here, and they are very important when it comes to IDing a lot of these uh, arthropods. Also, you should be looking at the rostrum. This is really important. Uh, if you take pictures of a shrimp because you want to ID it later, I would get pictures of the rostrum right here, and I would flatten out the 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 uh, uropod and telson and try to get pictures of those. You might be looking at a microscope for that, of course. And then also you wanna be looking at the legs too. Those are the most important things I would say. Um, let's see if there's anything else I forgot about that. There are some spines on there, antennae size. Yeah, that's another thing that you might wanna look at. And then, and then kilopeds, so pinchers. But yeah, shrimps are very tough to ID, I would say. If you have to do that, you know, good luck. It, it gets a lot easier after a while, if you, especially if you find a good manual. So there's some more obscure marine arth arthropods. I'm only gonna talk about a couple of them. Um, let's see, that you have the isopods, amphipods, uh, those ones are I'll talk about, but then you have your mycids. Those are really common, really important, um, but I just don't have enough time to get into them. And there's not a lot of work that's done on them, at least, not to my knowledge. Uh, so it's kind of hard to find any identification manuals for them. You have your krill, your euphasiids, ostracods, um, tineids. Uh, these are really common too. The tineids are pretty common in the plankton. You have your barnacles, super common in the plankton uh, when in their larval form. And your chamaeseans and clodocerans. And yeah, there's so many different types of animals you've probably never heard of. Uh, but if you do sampling surveys, you're going to see these and you're just going to be so confused. So I would get yourself a manual that just talks about arthropods. That's that's really important. I should have thrown that one in there. There's a good one that I used in Florida and it's just basically anything crunchy. They give you the class, you know, what did they generally look like? Like these leptostrocans right here. I had never seen one in my life. Someone came up to me with one and I was like, I know what that is. I've seen it in the book, you know, um, and I just got it down to class for them. You know, I didn't even get it down to family or anything, but it was really helpful. So yeah, uh, so these things, I wouldn't expect anybody to know without experience, but you should definitely get a book if you have to do this kind of stuff. So when it comes to your isopods, I won't go over all this stuff because uh, we don't have time for that. Uh, but if you want these slides or anything, just let me know. Uh, they're not all depressed roly polies, you know. So there's there's a lot that are kind of like this long, narrow shape. And then there's some that are uh, that are like this one right here. This is Ancinus depressus. It's actually uh, has a clutch or it has a uh, a bunch. It's, it has its babies. It's gravid. It has its babies on its on its belly there. I thought that was really neat. I just I looked under the microscope and I saw a bunch of eyes looking back at me. What's going on here? Uh, and also, I would like to stress again, once again, like this is the theme of this uh, talk, is don't rely on color. 
because four of these are the same species and one is different and they were all from the same sample. Like color is just not something you wanna go on. I believe this one's a different species. These four are Chirodotia arenicola and this one's Chirodotia excavata. Um, but I'd have to look at the claws to be sure. But yeah, once again, you look at your theopods and uropods. If you have an isopod, just take a picture of the top. <laughs> and then maybe flip it over and take a picture of the bottom. That's a good, that's a good one too. Um, because especially for the claws right here and, and maybe the, the legs too. For amphipods, I'm not even gonna get into it. Amphipods are tough. Amphipods are really tough. Uh, if you have to ID them, uh, once again, I, I'm, I'm sorry. It, it, is, it is fun to learn, I would say, but it gets very frustrating because they're really tough to see. They're tough to manipulate. This is where those super sharp forceps come into handy because you're gonna be on 64 magnification under your microscope and you're going to realize that you have to manipulate the animal on every exhale because you don't want to make a move that is wrong. So anyway, they get to be really tough. Learn the anatomy. Um, I would say it's actually most important to learn the anatomy on this one because you can't be constantly looking at your book. You have to pay more attention to what you're doing with your forceps. They get to be they get to be a little tough. And these are well, once again these are my drawings. Just trying to learn it. I would say they probably didn't help me that much because it takes so much more effort than drawing it to learn these things. It just takes a lot of experience going through the books. But yeah, head shape, um, flagella, you know, like the antennae, uh, the eye shape, all that stuff. I had to ID amphipods a lot and it's it's tough. So the mollusks I didn't cover um, are scaphopods, so your tusk shells. They used to be commonly used to trade um, in, I think, on the Pacific between Native Americans. Uh, and maybe it was actually on the East Coast. I forget. I, I remember hearing a, a, or I remember reading a random fact from them that was pretty cool about Native Americans using them for currency and for, uh, for trading. I didn't touch on the sea butterflies, the pteropods, or the nudibranchs. Nudibranchs are really neat. I've actually never had to ID them, thank goodness, because I think they're pretty tough. Um, there's no hard structures. It's all about, or no hard structures that I know of, uh, maybe the radula, but it's all about patterns, I believe. Uh, I'm not really 100% sure on nudibranchs. Everything else I've done, but in the cephalopods, uh, I've had to do the squid, I had to do the octopus, I've never had to do nautilus or cuttlefish. And then, the, then you have your polychaetes. Um, polychaetes, I won't get too into two either because I can do like I said, I can do the full semester of seminars on polychaetes. I love them so much. They're my favorite underdog. They, they're just so neat. Okay, so here's kind of uh, maybe your 64, or oh, I have it right here, like 40, yeah, 40 to 64, dep just depends on you know the species you're looking at. But this is like 40 times magnification. And then, you, so you're looking at the head. Here's some jaws. So these jaws are, are generally just when they're relaxed, they're in here, and then they shoot out to eat whatever. And that's <clears throat> um, pretty common with polychaetes. So, so then you look at things like your peri periopods and your, um, your prostomium and your peristomium, which are just parts of the head. You know, there's like the forward head, and then there's like the next segment right behind the head. The number of eyes, stuff like that. And then after 100 magnification, you're looking at these periopods right here. Uh, it, it's just so neat. I love this. I love this stuff. You, you pull this off, you put it on a slide, you mount the slide, you take it over to the compound scope, you go under 100 magnification, and then you're looking at a whole new set of things and your master detective straight from the 50s, you know, smoking a cigar in your office. Uh, and then, so so sometimes this isn't even enough. This is not even enough sometimes because because you're a detective and you have to take off these little hairs and <clears throat> you have to look under 200 magnification. You have to look at the shape of the hairs. So here's an example of the different shapes you might see. Um, and sometimes that's not even enough. So <laughs> if that's not enough, then um, you just hang up your hat and you go home. Uh, so I'm not, yeah, I don't have enough time for all this, but 
here's uh it's so it's such a diverse you know group of a uh, class of animals uh, you can each family sometimes it's a, a genus you might have to know the anatomy of a specific genus um, this is a psyllid it's in the family psyllidae and i think it's the only one with this proventricle muscle band but not even all of them have it visible so you don't need to know this for any other family even though there's 80 families this is the only one you need to know it for and this is a super diverse family so what all, all i'm trying to tell you is it, it's a lot of information if you want to go into IDing polychaetes you really have to <clears throat> bring your a game you want several books that talk about different families and um just general stuff about polychaetes yeah it was it was just a lot of fun learning about them i, I would actually take them home and do overtime i wouldn't get paid for it just learning about polychaetes um here's an example of another uh proboscis coming out so usually it's back here in the body and this one's shooting it out and th that's what it would do if it was trying to eat something um, sometimes they're in tubes here <clears throat> so if you find a tube or if you find a polychaete inside of a tube that really helps you narrow it down to what kind of polychaete it is because not you know not many of them make tubes or not a lot of them do make tubes but a majority of them don't so it just helps you narrow it down and what kind of tube it is, what they're using for substrate uh, can all help. Cause there's like ones that are called shingle worm tubes that they just make shingles. It looks like shingles are going down the tube. And then sometimes you can look at the jaw. This is me dissecting the jaws out of one. So the worms I didn't cover are, <laughs> there's a lot. Peanut worms, um, uh, your leeches and oligochetes, uh, the oligochetes aren't as common in the salt water, but they are there. Uh, the peanut worms are really common. The siphunculids are really common, especially in the coastal waters. They're the ones that like, they burrow into things a lot of times, or they'll use other things for habitat just because they have a really soft body and they kind of need that. You have your spoon worms, uh, your preapulids. Uh, they go by other names, especially in Alaska. Uh, but it is the common name for them, so I didn't want to like just leave it out because of that. And then you have your pheronids, and those are pretty common in estuaries. Uh, they're not very diverse at all, but you will see a lot of them in estuaries. Um, yeah, so the phyla I didn't cover, super diverse everywhere, cnidarians, echinoderms, bryozoans. Look, I went in alphabetical order here. Um, well, for the most part, except for echinoderms, and I didn't even get like out of E. So I'm just saying, like, there's a lot of animals I couldn't cover. Uh, I could, I can do a whole thing on on hydrozoans and cubozoans, um, and tenophores and bryozoans. I did a lot of bryozoan work. You can see right here. Here's a bryozoan. Here's a heart urchin. So I did a lot of sea urchin stuff. Here's a brachiopod and uh sea pen I actually didn't have to id any sea pens i just thought it was cool we caught it commercial fishing in washington and uh i just i had never seen one before anyway there's lots of diversity out there and lots of different phyla and it's it's tough um but i would say getting a, a very general guide and then if you want to identify a decapod like a crab or a shrimp or a hermit crab then I would get a book just on decapods. And maybe if you want to go even further down that road, maybe just on crabs or something like that. Uh, yeah, so here's some citations that I use for my diagrams. And uh, yeah, so I'll open it up for any questions after that. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, my, my boss at the University of Florida, Dr. Patrick Baker. He was super helpful and he gave me a long, you know, he gave me lots of room to do my own thing and because he knew I loved what I was doing so and he bought me all the identification guides and equipment that I could ever want all right so if anybody has any questions um y'all can just let me stop sharing my screen here and I've never been on this side of it participants okay so did anybody have any questions Uh, you can go ahead and raise your hand or you can just speak up.
Uh, hi, Colin. No, that was a great presentation. It was really helpful and informative with just uh, pretty much the basics of uh, um, in like invertebrate identification. And I really appreciated the giant list that you did of the, the field guides at the beginning. Um, my question is, uh, would it be okay with you if we shared the screenshots of, of that list? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and a lot of the stuff I grabbed from um, the new, more Newfoundland oriented things, uh, what the invertebrates, I should say, I don't really, I didn't really actually use so much. So I don't know how quality, I tried to grab things and look through them first and then put them up, but I don't know how thorough they are. With the fish ones I like I, that I was explaining, I, those ones are very thorough. So um, I did appreciate those ones. Thanks, awesome. Okay, Rebecca, yes, I can do that. <clears throat> oh yeah, some people didn't show up uh, or didn't uh, see the list right away. So here is, what is this? Um, here is a list of the identification books for that I was using for fish um, in the Labrador Sea. I would say this one was really helpful. Um, like I said, though, it's for the Gulf of St. Lawrence, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't get stuck trying to identify a species if you're on the Atlantic side more, because you might be seeing something else, um, and it might not be included in the Gulf of St. Lawrence field guides. Um, some, a lot of times, um, a lot of times, animal identification experts even get way too confident in what they're looking at and uh, they get stuck on something and they think they, they're looking through a guide and it's maybe it's a th very thorough guide, but what they're IDing doesn't exactly line up, but they're like, it's close enough. No, it's, a lot of times it's not close enough. So um, don't try to make it a certain animal is what I'm saying. And then um, I'll, I'll scroll right here to um, the invertebrate guides I was looking up. The ones with asterisks are the ones that I've used, um, are the ones that I've used in even in Florida, like this one right here. And this one's for the Pacific coast. I used it in Florida, but I didn't use it for species like I was saying earlier. I just used it for family identification and sometimes uh, a genus. It's really helpful and it actually explains a little bit about their biology and uh, and that can be really helpful too because you have context. Um, maybe it's a maybe it's a parasite or something like that. Yep. Are there any other questions? You're welcome, Rebecca. All right, so I'm just gonna wrap it up here. Um, so, uh, so thank you so much for attending today. I hope you learned something and uh, I hope your eyes haven't permanently glazed over. <laughs> I know it can get a little dry, uh, animal identification, but when you're in the moment and you're being a detective, I promise you it is a lot of fun. Um, if you have to do it for a job, just think of yourself as master detective uh, and you should be entertaining yourself pretty good. Uh, so I, I do want to say, though, next week is probably our last gap week when it comes to seminars. We're not going to have a seminar next week. Um, but after that, we're going to have seven in a row. So there's going to be no more gaps after after next week. Um, and we will have Dr. Carl Walters coming in and we'll just have we'll have a lot of really big names. So so it'll be fun. Um, anyway, thanks for coming. And I hope you learned a little bit today. Have a good Wednesday.